so your interest is in like figuring out which pollinators are here and how they're interacting with the with the system. Yes, um, especially what pollinators are out here and in this area that is undergoing all these different um, management regimes. So I'm curious to know how the people, the state agencies, are going to do different uh, mowing or cutting or burning and how that affects these as well because that's something if you as a state agency know how to best manage the habitat that keeps the bees in mind, that's a good thing. And those are experiments in and of themselves in managing the ecosystem as a whole and reptiles and birds and all kinds of things, right? Yeah, reptiles, birds, snakes, box turtles, yeah. bees, the So you're part of it is you're you're part of it is pollinators. I'm the bee team. Yeah, that's good. That's it. So it's kinda of fun to see and, and if you kinda of look around you can see that there's an area that was burned not too long ago because it doesn't have leaves. And this area... Or that snag been... of a tree out there, can we presume yeah. that was mm -hmm. fire burned. damage? And so they've learned that they're not going to cut or treat everything all at one time. Yeah, that makes sense. So that they cut a little bit here and a little bit there, and then whatever species in that habitat can move so it's not going to be killed. And it, it's also important to leave those dead trees like that too, those snags. You, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, there's... Sure beetles and for birds and for um, bees that nest in cavities. Um, Keith was telling me there's uh, pileated woodpeckers out here, is that yes, right? they're gorgeous. I've never seen one in real life, but I've just seen pictures of them. They're really big and spectacular looking, yeah. right? Yeah, they look like Woody Woodpeckers. We heard some. He he was pointing out some calls. Yeah? Uh, but I haven't got a glimpse of one yet. That would uh, be nice. Too bad. Maybe before you go, because they yeah. are stunning. And there's, uh, what, an incredible amount of diversity of bees here. What are we saying? There's 170 species or something well, in the state? and 53 that we know of right now. Right, right here? Yep, yep. Wow. Some that we're kind of still trying to figure out uh, what they are. Yeah. Because there is a guy who studies bees and has been going through museum collections and redescribing them and making oh, yeah. name corrections and things like that. So we wouldn't, without the work he was doing, we wouldn't have known what we had because this there, area has so many. Are, and are there a lot of very closely related bees that on first glance might seem to be the same species, but yes. then when you study them closely you realize that they're actually different species? Yeah, you got it. That's the tricky one. If I were to open up a box and say, these are all different species, you'd say, what? Yeah. They all look the same yeah. to me. Yeah. And then you have to look at the, the patterns on their body, the pit patterns and hair patterns and... Yeah, that subtle little differences. Too. And I mean, they're clearly very, very closely related. Very closely But uh, related. have their own characteristics. Yep. You, yep. Yeah, so that's pretty neat. And somebody's got to do it. You have to figure out how all that works. Well, I think it's important yeah. to know this. And, and they say, well, uh, all this habitat loss and all this climate warming, and we have to know how it's going to affect these species. Oh, well, you get a baseline. You have to study, uh, sort of understand what's here right now in order to have any appreciation of how things are changing. Exactly. Yeah. So we've got some baseline data here. Yeah. And if we came back in 10 years and sampled again using the same methods, we'd know uh, what was still here, whose numbers might be yeah. lower. Yeah. We know a lot more now. And okay. there's natural, natural fluctuations in normal healthy habitats. Yes. You know, season to season, year to year, even, you know, decade to decade, there can be variations. So, um, and that's why these long-term studies are yeah. important. Because yeah. if I had studied just in 1993 and then just in 1994, you would have thought maybe from the, the data collected it was two completely different areas. Yeah. Yeah. Or that different. Yeah. But that's just what's expected with bees and any number of other insects. So very important area because it's the bees that drive these ecosystem services. It's their pollinating plants which give us seeds, so the, the, berries. The, the type of bees and numbers of them available are going to affect the distribution of different species of plants which are going to affect all the other organisms that interact and depend on those. The thing that's going to, the caterpillars that need to eat the plant, the birds the that birds. need to eat the seeds or berries. The yeah, Keith was just telling me that the, um, the moth caterpillars are so much more important to the uh, successful raising of chicks for birds and they, they, they realized before it's like the moth caterpillars are primarily it that's oh. really did you know about that I didn't know yeah are they and just it, full, more full of fats or yes and and how easy they are to obtain and how easy they are for the chick I mean they'll eat any bug probably for the most part but you get some insect with a lot of 
exoskeleton and just it's like harder for the chick to pass through. <laughs> but a, a caterpillar is just a nice little bag of juicy goodies, right? Protein and fat. Does it, could it be a butterfly caterpillar or just a moth? I think either one. Yeah. But, you know, uh, moths are predominant yeah. in these habitats. You can have super abundance of moths, just yeah. like thousands and thousands of the caterpillars yeah. Yeah. that are just kind of inconsequential little caterpillars people don't really notice, yeah. but really an important food source. So they're talking about if they want to manage habitat to improve songbird, you know, success, nest, raising nests of chicks, they have to manage the uh, caterpillar habitat and the caterpillars are tied to plants and the plants are tied to pollinators so yeah. it's all interconnected. Well not all pollinators so we see these oaks here and they're actually wind pollinated. Well yes if yeah but, but for the you know herbaceous plants that use flowers there you go. right and there's a lot of um, uh, insects that depend on those sort of things but and you're right yeah. Another exciting thing about the site is there's very few invasive species. Huh. It seems that they uh, haven't really taken hold here. So it What's that Japanese plant? And Keith was pointing that out to me. The Japanese plant. Knotweed, plant. yeah. Mm, when that spreads, it spreads yeah. like wildfire. Yeah. And they don't really know how to get rid of it yet. No. I thought maybe they could try and bring in some other insects from its native habitat that might eat it. But that worked in the West uh, for uh, ragwort tansy. Oh, yeah? They brought in uh, a cinnabar moth, which was a zyganid moth from Europe that fed exclusively on this tansy. And so they had to spread these caterpillars all around. You have to be careful with introductions. You sure do. But in this case, it worked really, really well. We could just... Um, yeah, I think uh, people are a little bit smarter about the introductions. Yeah, it's okay. worked really well. It takes some time to, you know, to, to knock down the tansy, but, you know, it's better than spraying Roundup or something out there and yeah. damaging the rest of the habitat. The trouble with the tansy is it's, uh, especially is that it's toxic to animals, uh, and yet they, they eat it, so maybe it's not bitter enough or something. So cattle and horses and things will eat the tansy and it makes them really sick. Oh. So that's been the problem. But yeah, in some cases you can introduce an insect to control a plant. Um, in, the, in the northwest with the um, uh, uh, that um, Scott's broom, yeah. uh, they just find if they just mow it. If you kill it before it seeds, then eventually you'll knock it down. But it's illegal to plant it now, right? What's that? It's illegal to plant it or purchase it from nurseries. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it should be if it isn't. <laughs> See, under these power lines here? Yeah. It's all quiet now, right? But I mentioned to you there's that cellophane bee. Yeah. And they, they nest in these really dense aggregations. So each oh, nest has right. its own nest. Yeah, I've seen stuff like that in, in the Northwest. Yep. So the neat thing about this bee is it has a little gland, and so it digs into the sandy soil, and it can line the nest cavity where it's going to bring back the pollen and have the yeah. egg develop into a larva and then pupa and so on. And this material that this bee creates is an antifungal, antibacterial, flexible, and waterproof. Right? Like, how neat is that? And so I was out here one day and there were some scientists from one of the Boston universities, material science people, yeah. and they were trying to figure out how to make this so they could use it for bandages or... Oh yeah, think you know, of it. Think like of the that. possibilities. They, at that time, they had been working on it for several years and they couldn't recreate what nature had made so perfectly. Yeah, I'd heard that you know, like some of the cyanocrylate glues were developed from barnacle adhesion, yeah. barnacle adhesives or something. Yeah, it's and like, you may have they actually they recreated the gecko. Uh, oh foot. right, yeah, yeah. They figured out how all that works. Yeah. And it's more complicated than they thought. Yeah. But yeah, those are good examples of how, you know, people if they're really just sort of people centered to say, oh, this organism doesn't do anything for us. It's no good for anything. You don't know. You just don't know that you could, uh, the Pacific yew tree in the Northwest, the loggers would just pile them up and burn them till they found they had taxol in the bark, which was a really good drug treatment for certain forms of cancer. Yeah. Suddenly that stuff was worth a fortune. Yeah. And they'd just been throwing it away for a hundred years. Yeah. Right? So here, all along here, we've got Hundreds of bees in the spring. You'd never know it right now. Yeah. Would you? Yeah, They're late in the season. Waiting for next spring to come out. I remember in uh, I was up on Whidbey Island in Washington, and um, there was all these bees on this sandy embankment, and we climbed up there, and they each had their each little hole. Yeah. Could have been the same kind of thing. They each had their own little hole in the ground that they were provisioning with pollen, probably, right? Yeah. But you could see as a group, if you just had one. You could be kind of vulnerable to a predator, but if you had like hundreds of them all together, 
there's kind of a deterrent <laughs> factor, right? Or a better chance of surviving than if you were just out the there. The selfish all alone. herd, yeah. Yeah. The predators are going to get one, but it's not going to be you or yep. something. So bees, when I hold the net up, they'll go to the top. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Come on. Oh, Use it by equip snap top vials is my favorite. Yeah, well I wasn't really prepared. I can even use a coffee cup to catch them. Alright, so what do we got? So there we have, see that great big head on that yeah. bee? Yeah. And the nice stripy abdomen. Yep. That's gonna be Helictus ligatus and look at that. She's got so Loaded much. Loaded with pollen, pollen man. Couldn't yeah. fly with much more than that. No. So that's a nice bee. All right. Now I feel like I should get my net out and help you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Available. You don't see any other flowers around. You saw the pollen on that one bee. Yeah. And there would be just there's one. Oh, that's a wasp. Well, we had some storm coming through here a few days ago and stuff, right? I don't know. Does it have any difference on it? I think so. So you just kind of wonder. It was a, an odd year. It was a very hot year. Then there was a lot of rain. Right. But it's just a, a sort of a mystery why yeah. this year, of all years, these aren't covered with bees. Because there's pollen. Well, there's, there's more there. variables than we can ever even consider, usually. Completely. Yeah. So, how well, let's look around farther. Everything's different. Plain. And where all these little rivulets, when the glacier receded, this is where it was dropping the water. And where it slowed down, so it dropped Dropped the all the sediment. Mm hmm And so when you look, you can see it's a delta outwash plain. You can see where it's coming in. So when we go in here, you're going to get a sense of just how sandy it is. And so this is a, an area that was mined for gravel, is that? Yes. Okay. And how long has it been since that was active? Or? I don't know exactly. Since the state has had it, and they're trying to keep the... Um, Oh, the sand buggies and SUVs. Right, yeah, the, recreational vehicles. Yeah, trying to limit access. Uh, low nutrient soil. Yeah. And it's just pretty interesting to see this. And then, again, they estimate that this sand would go down 80 feet. Wow. That's a lot. So this um, ancient glacial Lake Hitchcock was responsible for a lot of this sandy area, all the way down to Connecticut. Wow. And you can see because the, um, there's the... If we were to go north of here, the deposits are bigger, rockier uh, chunks. Right, yeah. That, so it was higher um, moving water. And then when you go to Connecticut, it's super, super silty. Yeah. Mine, so that people who mine the sand from these gravel pits in Connecticut have to wear face masks. Wow. To protect their lungs. And then here is sort of uh, intermediate. But let's walk along. Let's go yeah. see what we can find. Yeah, I can see some go. goldenrod over there. Goldenrod and... And then I, so one of the things I thought about when I was um, proposing to do the study here, one is that it's you know, 15 minutes from the school bus. Yeah, that's nice. Convenient. Do everything is that bees are at their highest diversity in sandy areas like the Pacific, yeah. uh, excuse me, Pacific Northwest, the um, Southwest, yeah. Turkey, you know, those areas. I thought, wow, if yeah. this is sandy, yeah. then that seems like it would be good. But then I've just, I, then I did a... I was studying uh, gravel pits in this area. I had 12, and in various states of activity. I didn't find the diversity that I have here, so that's still being worked out. Hmm. Let's see it. Oh, yeah. They're pretty? Yeah. I really love the green ones. Yeah. They're so pretty. I know. Any All green or green with the yellow striped abdomen. It's just gorgeous. Yeah, I take it. Do you have it? No. Yeah. Yeah, those are nice. Okay, so what do we got here? These are bees? Yeah, these are bees that were collected in um, lawns in a big city in an urban environment. And the people who volunteered to let us take the bees from their yards didn't put down any chemicals. And they're very sandy yards because of the glacial history. There's just a lot of sand there. So that's, we thought, well, maybe good for bees. And we were way surprised at bees. You found that there's 114 species of bees in these lawns. Wow. And most people think about lawns, I think they're just horrible. But I guess if you have to live with lawns, 
But I mean, there must be like tiny little flowers and stuff popping up in between and tiny stuff, isn't little there? Like flowers all throughout the lawn. Yeah, and that's what they're working on. And that's what they're working on. So we see these small little bodied bees, and we know that they're probably not going very far because the roads act as barriers. Yeah. Um, but what the bees need in these lawns there is little flowers if you don't kill them with herbicides. And yeah. there's places to nest yeah. and reproduce. And then the bigger bees, we figure, probably come in to visit the the bee bowls where they were collected or the different flowers that might be planted around the houses. But uh, Okay, so you were telling me earlier a lot of these little ones, you might not realize that they were actually different species. No. Unless you get really up close. Right. Because even just looking at these, a lot of these look really the same, but are they in groupings of species? It they looks are like in it, groupings. doesn't it? So this here, these are all one species here. Yeah. And these this is a group of different boy bees. Oh. They're tough. This is a bee actually that's considered, it's a parasite bee. So they don't have to go out and collect pollen. They don't have to provision a nest. They just zip into the hole of another species and lay their egg in, yeah. in the nest. So a lot of that going on. Seems to be. And yeah. I mean across different orders of insects too, just mm -hmm, like stealing. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then, then these are some bees that I've been working on recently. But even though we know a lot, some of these little bees are just pretty tough, and I couldn't get some I'm of them. Tough to identify, so mm -hmm. you don't really know. Mm -hmm. So you can't figure out what something is particularly... There's always somebody who knows things a little bit better. So do yes. you farm them out to people who are better... Well, that's educated. what you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this is a neat story. So this was the most abundant bee that was found in her lawns. I think that group, they're all missing heads. But what are they? They're called Lazioglossum illinoiensis. And you can figure out what they are even if they don't have a head on their body. They're pretty distinctive. Yeah. But we were pretty excited about that because we thought it was a new state record. But then we went to the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology, and there was a record in the museum that was from 1920 from a biology professor at uh, Wellesley College. One <laughs> other record. Wow. No. Now we talk about a record. Was that an actual specimen that was, it was there? It was an actual specimen and that's why museums are so it important. It just goes to show why, why the collections are important because we can Huge. get information. Huge. And what, when did you say 1920? 19, in the 1920s he didn't put a date on it. It wasn't labeled as well. So it's like 90 it years, 90 year old. Yeah. One other yeah. specimen yeah. in a different part of the state. And then Susanna pulls them out like nobody's business. Wow. So uh, it had previously been thought that New Haven was the northern edge of its range. So pretty cool that she was able to get those. Nice. Yeah. All right, cool. So lots of stories in these. That takes a lot of work to um, prepare specimens uh, this sort of methodically. I mean, you look how consistent they all are and get all the data labels and everything on it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the not as exciting part of yeah, the work, but, but it's, it's very, very important. It's very important, and it's respectful to the animals. Yeah, you if you, I tell people, if you don't have um, data on the specimen, you just have a dead bug on a pin, and it's completely useless, and you killed that bug for no reason. It's, yeah. So all my little kid friends, I'm always like, good data, get good data. <laughs> yep. <laughs> or and don't then, bother. <laughs> and then it can go on. Yeah, so. and in the future, yeah.